agent here and we're getting ready to perform a cervical duke laser disc repair that's on the cervical spine and we just placed the needle what's going on ladies everything okay okay um do i need to stop what i'm doing or can i proceed all right, so I want to uh, make sure you guys are good before I proceed. Let me know when I can take a shot. All right. So we've introduced the spinal needle through the front of the spine into the neck shot. And we're advancing, I'm advancing the needle into a disc shot. This disc is the, if you look at the top of the x-ray, um, Jordan, show them C2. Good. That's C2. Then go to C3, C4, C5, C6. So this is the C5, C6 disc. This patient has three herniated discs with degenerative disc disease. Combination of herniated disc. He let it go for a long time. It's turned into degenerative disc disease. So he's got a combination of herniated disc and degenerative disc disease. Our goal is to go into the back of this disc and remove the herniation that's pushing on the nerves and spinal cord that's causing extreme weakness of his right hand. He literally has all the muscles in his hand gone. And he has, can't even move, use his hand. He's basically paralyzed in his right hand because the herniation has caused such damage to the nerves. So we told him he needs surgery right away and he's getting it. Um, hopefully we can get some of the function restored, but whenever you get to severe atrophy and almost complete paralysis of a hand, it's really hard to bring anything back, but you do need to stop it from getting worse if you can. And that's what we're trying to do today. Are we good, doctor? Can I proceed? Just tell me if uh, you want me to wait, I'll wait. If you want me to proceed, I'll proceed. All right. So you can see that our spinal needle has gone through the front of the neck and we're entering the C5-6 disc through the front. We're gonna do a discogram, then we're gonna bring the guide wire down, we're gonna then make an incision, and we're gonna bring our dilator down through the disc to the back of the disc where the herniation is, and then we're gonna bring our tube down and then perform the endoscopic surgery. But I wanna give my anesthesiologist an opportunity to finish what she's doing. Okay, we're all set, we're all set. good, okay. Um, so I do need to do a discogram with the discogram. I'll be looking at the structure of the disc from the inside to see how damaged it is, but also to look for any tears or leaks in the backside shot. And there's our discogram. So I'm going to pull the shoulders. Let's get another shot now. Okay. You can see the dye is leaking out the back. Let's just do one more. Hold on. Um, Luis, give it a tiny little squirt. And we'll do a shot in a minute. A little squirt, go on. You feel it move? Shot? All right, there we go. Show the audience the tear in the back of the disc, Jordan, at C5, 6, right there. You see the dark material? That's leaking out through the tear. And that's in the epidural space. You can see the herniation. There's also bone spur there. So we're done with the discogram. Unlike the first patient we did this morning, where her discogram was provocative or evocative. She was awake. She could tell us if it hurt. This patient is completely asleep. And this patient is intubated, meaning they have a tube in. They're under general anesthesia. So they're not going to be talking to us. They're completely relaxed, chemically paralyzed, and they are uh, totally out. And we're ventilating for them. I'm going to bring the needle out now that I've got the guide wire in. We're th doing three discs today. These are degenerative discs, herniated discs, combination. The reason they're degenerated is this patient let this go too long. So if you have a herniated disc and you don't want it to get worse, you need to get it treated quickly with the Duke laser disc repair so it doesn't get worse. What causes the degeneration of the disc is the fact that you allow the inflammation to keep going without fixing the tear in the back of the disc called the annular tear. Once the annular tear is repaired with the laser, it will heal and the inflammation stops. When the inflammation stops in the annulus, then the uh, degeneration stops. All right, so I'm gonna make my incision. It is four millimeters. And again, we're on the 
right side, I'm uh, sorry, left side of the patient's neck. We always go to the opposite side that the patient has the worst symptoms. So this patient's symptoms are in the right hand predominantly with severe atrophy of the hand and they can't even, I just saw them pre-op, their hands like this. I said, move your hand and he's like this. That's how bad it is, it's horrible. Three pinch nerves, we're gonna fix all three today. So here we go with the dilator down. Shot. You can see the dilator advancing to the front of the spine. And I'm going past the carotid artery, past the jugular vein. Shot. You can see right now the tip of the dilator is right where the endotracheal tube is. So I'm at the level of the trachea. I'm just lateral to the trachea. And you can see the esophageal tube down there, shot. I'm making my way down to the front of the spine. I'm just medial now to the carotid artery and the jugular vein and the carotid sheath, shot. Now the tip of the dilator is sitting in the front of the spine and I'm just to the side of the esophagus. I could feel it move over. So I'm sitting on the front of the spine and the esophagus is this side, the trachea is this side, the carotid artery is this side, the jugular vein is on this side, and I'm right between them. And we're gonna go to the front of the spine, I can feel it. And now I'm going to advance this into the disc through the front. I twist it and I uh, push it just gently, shot. I just want to get it started. I want to get it through the anterior ligament. Oh, let's do a quick AP. Luis is hinting. Let's see where the tip is. It should be around the middle of the spine. It's important that you keep it within about a centimeter of the center of the spine. Now, can you center that up, please? Yep, looks perfect. We're right there. Of course, the head is twisted a little bit, um, but. Yeah, it looks good. So you can see the guide wire passes, goes from the center out to the right foramen. And that's where we're gonna end up once we get down there. But we gotta move the dilator through the disc. And to do that, I've gotta first remove this guide wire out of the center. And that's what I'm gonna do now. And then I take a mallet, which is a hammer, and I'm gonna advance it. Shot, and I can feel it going through the disc right now. The disc is the path of least resistance. Okay, if I was going through the bone, it would be a lot harder to do. Shot. So I'm now at the back of the disc. I've directed it. I've given a little up pressure to move it so it doesn't hit the back of the vertebral body and lop off a bone spur. We don't want that. So we're now in the back of the disc. Things are looking good. We're right there at the foramen right at the base of the herniation. All right, I know this appears to most of you. If I show this surgery to neurosurgeons, they would literally fall out of their chair. They've never seen anything like this, you know, and orthopedic same, orthopedic spine surgeon. Why? Is this a secretive procedure? No, I broadcast it every week. The problem is it's not being taught at the universities because uh, there's other surgeries that can be done like fusion with metal and cages. They make a lot more money for the surgeon, for the hospital, for the companies that sell the metal. Um, but patients are unaware that they're basically being used um, to make money, a ton of money. These surgeries are less expensive endoscopically and there's no metal being put in. So. There is no marketing by big companies that are selling metal things. And so this, this surgery you're watching is a much more advanced surgery, but there's far less money to be made by big companies and corporations. Therefore, it's not being promoted at the universities. The universities are fully controlled by big corporations that sell metal. And all the universities are doing is putting in fusion and artificial discs. And the patients are the ones who are suffering because they're getting the metal stuck in their body that they don't need. Why do we broadcast? We're broadcasting to raise awareness of this problem so that people will actually do something about it unless they want metal. All right, 
So this is a four millimeter incision I'm working with and I'm bringing the tube down. We're gonna do the whole surgery through a four millimeter tube. And I'm just trying to advance the tube over the dilator shot. I've got some new gloves today, some new x-ray gloves. They're the black gloves you can see on my fingers underneath my regular gloves. And uh, they're shielding my body from the radiation from the x-ray machine. There, we don't use a lot of radiation. You use about 10 times as much radiation doing a fusion or an artificial disc surgery. So our laser surgeries use far less radiation, but we still use radiation. And you want to protect the patient and you want to protect the staff. So everybody's wearing special radiation gowns. All right, can you give me some traction, please? I was talking to somebody last night, his name is John. And John is a rugby player, football player, he's a trainer. And John is going to have a three-level cervical fusion next week on Monday. Monday? Tuesday. No, John is having surgery somewhere else in the oh. world. And John is scared to death of having that fusion, and he should be, because he's going to have a long metal plate put in his neck. And I told him, don't do it, shot. But he said, I'm a hopeless case. I have to have fusion. I say, no, you don't. Look at this right here. I said, tomorrow morning, I'm going to broadcast worldwide a live spine surgery, and we're going to show the laser surgery. I said, you're welcome to come and watch. And maybe this will change your life in a good way. So I really hope John made it. For those of you who wonder, this guy, Dr. Ara Dukmajan on Facebook, is it really me? The answer is yes, it really is me. Why? Because I want to help people avoid unnecessary, dangerous surgeries like fusions. All right, so we are just with this tip of the dilator. You can see it just in the foramen. And I'm going to bring this forward just a little bit more shot. I'm almost where I want to be with my tube. Perfect. That's pretty darn good. I'm going to stop right there. All right, we're ready to take the dilator out. Ta-da, magic. And we're going to do the entire surgery through this little tube, folks. Look at the size of this tube. It's one, it's, it's a four millimeter tube, okay? Y'all see this? You see this? Yes, we see it. Four millimeters. If you showed this surgery to neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons right now, they would say, what in God's great earth is happening? I've never seen anything like that. How could anyone do surgery through a tube that small? That's exactly what I said when I first saw the surgery done in South Korea. And the Koreans are the ones who developed this stuff. It's all FDA approved. It's manufactured in Germany and it's totally FDA approved. We do it here in the States. I've been doing this for 15 years now. But the first time I saw the Koreans do this, I literally had to scrape my jaw off the floor because I'd never seen anything like this. All of our surgeries in the States are done open with big incisions and big dissection. I've never seen this. And then when I saw it and I saw how well the patient did with that one surgery, I was, I was changed forever as a spine surgeon. Now that's all we really do at Duke Spine is endoscopic surgery. I went from doing a uh, hundred ACDFs a year to now doing less than five. Okay, down the rabbit's hole we go. Oh yeah, were you holding that whole time? Sorry, I apologize. It's all Luis's fault. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I feel terrible. All right. My anesthesiologist was holding the patients the whole time. Uh, she thought she didn't realize that I was done needing her to hold, but thank you. All right. So we went in and already I can see a piece of herniation. I'm going to reach in there and grab it out and give it to Luis. 
and it's I don't think I got it why don't you show our audience why we do surgery for herniated discs like how did how did herniated disc cause neck pain or arm symptoms okay. what is this annular tear all about injury on the disc can cause annular tears to form Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissue develops within the annular tear causing neck pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause worsening symptoms. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to the nearby nerve roots, causing arm pain. Pain signals travel up the nerves to the brain, causing localized neck pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex causing conscious awareness of neck pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc in neck pain, submit your MRI for a live. Okay, so we are back here um, live doing uh, Duke laser disc repair surgery on three herniated discs in someone's neck and our patient has had a herniated disc for a long time three herniated discs to be exact, so long that he's developed degenerative disc disease, putting the surgery off. Didn't want a fusion, wanted to wait for better technology to come around, and here it is, the Duke laser disc repair. Basically, this is an endoscopic procedure, and endoscopic surgeries are done all over the world for other things like gallbladders or, you know, hysterectomies and, you know, all kinds of endoscopic orthopedic procedures on knees and hips and shoulders, meniscus. But only now is spine surgery starting to see endoscopic procedures being done more and more commonly. And um, of course, the lower back is the top place to do endoscopic surgery. That's the most common endoscopic surgery is done in the lower back. But we also are able to do it now in the neck and in the thoracic spine as well. This is a herniation right here that I'm blasting away with a laser. It's breaking it up into small pieces. We call this process, oh, look at the herniation that just came out. That is a herniation. It just came out of the foramen on the right side. That was pushing up against the nerve. And here it is right there. I'm gonna go grab it out because it, it doesn't wanna just come out. It's not going to be a giant one like we see in the lower back. These are usually small little pieces. I think that's it. And typically when we remove herniations, because the herniations are, a, a herniated disc is usually not a solitary event. It's um, an event that occurs starting with a tear in the back of the disc, which we showed you on the video. And then you get squeezing of the jelly from the center of the disc, which is all back here close to me, and that squeezes through the tear. And then that, that's called the herniation of the nucleus propulsus. And that stuff that squeezes through the tear, um, the nuclear material, is what causes the degeneration of the disc to occur over time. But it also it's what pinches the nerves out in the foramen. So that's what I have to remove from the neural foramen are those little pieces of herniation. So I got to manipulate this um, tube and I got to manipulate the laser, move it around in order to um, get to the foramen and remove the pieces of herniation that are pushing on the nerve, causing this patient's problems. As I decompress the foramen, you'll see more bleeding. That's something that we see in neurosurgery as as we get the pressure off the epidural veins and the nerve and the dura. Here's another herniation fragment right there that just came out. 
And again, I was trying to say, as I said earlier, there's a tear and then you get squirty of all these little uh, pieces of herniation of nuclear material that squeeze out. So it doesn't happen at one time. Um, it happens as, in multiple pieces over, over time, multiple times, which is why people with herniated discs frequently report that, oh yeah, I had pain and then it got better and then six months later it hurt again and then it got better. It's basically multiple episodes of herniation that's happening through the tear in the back of the disc. So it's really important to get it fixed early before the disc degenerates all the way because we're not capable, we're not able to put um, biological disc back. We're only able to put metal disc back and you don't want a metal disc in your neck. All these companies that sell artificial discs, they're in it for one reason, the money. Literally, they know about endoscopic surgery and they're keeping you from finding out about it. They have the ability to market it. They have the ability to promote endoscopic spine surgery, but they don't because there's no money in it for them. Endoscopic surgery like this doesn't use implants. It doesn't use metal discs. It doesn't use plates. It doesn't use screws. The screws that those companies sell run about $150 a screw. I mean, you would normally go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you would pay maybe five cents a screw. But the screws that go into the spine cost hundreds of dollars. And if you're doing it in the lower back, it's a thousand dollars a screw. So there's huge money to be made, profits to be made by these companies that are selling the metal that goes into people's necks and backs. And because of that, they don't want people to know about laser endoscopic surgery because there is no metal to sell. You understand? It's literally all natural. Stand by. There's a couple of huge herniations back here. I'm trying to get them. And they're just too big. I don't know if I can pull them out. I doubt it. I may have to break them up into little pieces. But I can see them. They're just not coming out. I'm going to have to keep working on them, breaking them up. It's going to be one of those long and painful surgeries. You can already tell. So this is the herniation down here. You see this? And the white stuff is uh, the part of the herniation that was attached to the end plate. That's the surface of the bone. And the blue stuff is the nucleus pulposus. And of course, that other thing is the laser fiber. Oh, by the way, the first surgery we did, that patient's already gone. The laser surgery, the three level lumbar. She was a work comp patient and she's already left. Uh huh. So you can see the yellow is calcium or bone spur. And the calcium turns a golden color when you hit it with a laser energy. But I see I'm cutting this herniation in half with the laser. And I'm hoping I can, there we go, there's a piece. By chopping it up inside the back of this disc, I can remove it piece by piece. That's a process called piecemeal. Piecemeal removal of, you know, whether it's a tumor or herniated, there we go, I may be able to grab that out now. Whether it's a tumor or herniated disc, if you can't get the whole thing out safely in one big piece, you got to break it up into little pieces and take it out piecemeal. And there's a piece right there. Let's take a look. Get the light on and I'm going to show you all. Bring me a blue towel. Can you guys see this? Yes, we can see it. Right here. Get a good view of that. See it? Yeah, we see it. And there's the grabber. Just grabbed it out. So I broke it in half with the laser and then pulled it out. Pretty cool, huh? No need for open neck surgery, no need for fusion, no need for metal, no need for cages, no need for cadaver bone, no need for biological material like bone graft or BMP or demineralized bone matrix, okay? But 
the problem is your surgeons won't tell you about this surgery because well, they make far too much money doing fusions. That's really what it comes down to. But that's not in your best interest. Okay. Well, let's get some questions underway. All right, we have a comment from Facebook. It says, thank you for sharing this from Tuscan, Arizona. All right. Uh -huh. Nice yeah. of you to join us. Mm -hmm. Arizona is a beautiful place. I like it a lot. And now we have another question. What made you recommend this procedure to this patient? What, make me, what made me recommend this procedure to this patient? Well, this patient had herniated discs that were causing symptoms so oh there's a biggie let's look at this one here we're gonna have to look at this one this is so cool this is the other half of that one you guys see this yeah we see it Woo! hot diggity dog it reminds me of my dashkin my little wiener dog it's so long all right anyway look you know what can i say it's one of those days. Um, so herniated discs that were causing symptoms. Any patient that has pain in their neck, pain down their arm, or numbness or tingling or weakness, those are symptoms of a pinched nerve and a herniated disc. And just to be clear, the pinched nerve causes the arm symptoms but the herniated disc, the tear in the back of the herniated disc causes the neck pain and headaches that come with it. So whether you have just neck pain or you have um, arm symptoms or myelopathy, which is spinal cord dysfunction, any of those things are a reason to get surgery on your discs in your neck to treat those symptoms. So I knew this patient needed surgery, just like there are millions of people out there with herniated discs in their neck or bulging discs in their neck, and they need treatment, they need surgery, okay? Then the question becomes, well, what surgery should we do, right? And when you are a spine surgeon that only knows how to do fusions, or you're a spine surgeon that only does artificial discs then you're limited in what you can offer that patient for treatment to whatever it is you do but the best surgeons are the ones who can do every type of spine surgery and can pick and offer their patient the best spine surgery and in the best spine surgery for a herniated disc in the neck is the Duke laser disc repair, endoscopic. The problem is your surgeon won't talk to you about this surgery because they don't do it. They don't know how to do it. It takes extra training, which they've not done. And it takes prioritizing your patient's needs ahead of your own financial needs, which they can't do. So why did I recommend this surgery? Because it's the best surgery in the world for a herniated disc in the neck that causes symptoms of pinched nerves or neck pain or headaches. That's why. That's why I recommended this surgery. I hope that answers your question. Now I could have also done an ACDF, an anterior cervical discectomy infusion, but that's a far more invasive surgery more risky and this patient didn't want it they wanted they wanted the minimally invasive endoscopic surgery honestly i don't blame them i would choose the same surgery so one of the benefits of laser and this is really important for those of you who are perceptive and i've told you before the laser doesn't just deliver energy to the tissue and break it up which is very important by the way and we needed to do that but it does something else it creates a shock wave a shock wave in the water that water down there 
And that shock wave actually wiggles loose the herniated fragments and gets them to float out towards the surface so I can get them out of there. And you can see that sometimes. You'll just see the herniations wiggle loose. Okay, and that's very important. Oh, there's one. That's a, that came out of the foramen. And that's a very important feature of this laser. And if you don't use the laser, you don't get that feature, okay? And that's essential, in my opinion, to a successful endoscopic Duke laser disc repair is the, is the vibration, so to speak, that wiggles out herniations from the, the back of the disc. Right, Luis? Yes, so you can't do this surgery without the laser. It's essential. All right, I'm going to flip sides. Now this is going to be a long surgery because there's so much damage to the discs. There's a lot of herniation. There's a lot of bone spur, which takes time to get that stuff out. I've been working on it. I don't know if you noticed that, but that ridge I was working on earlier is a bone spur ridge. We're not going to get all the bone spurs for sure. We're not here to get all the bone spurs. All these bone spurs are not causing symptoms, okay? Only certain ones are, and those are the ones that I'm gonna be focusing on fixing. Uh, Dr. Duke, do you have time for a question? I do. Okay. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay, cool. On Facebook, we have a commenter saying that they have the same issues as the patient being operated on. Yeah. He asks, do you encourage to fix the problem before it interferes with my quality of life oh, or God, wait yeah. until my quality of life is poor? Oh, no. All right, so great question. First of all, thank you for asking the question. And I say that because there's so much we can learn from these questions. And, you know, the people asking these questions are asking for a reason because they've been presented with the opinion that you should wait until these herniations are far worse. I've heard some crazy stuff. Look, you have a herniation, you got neck pain. Get it fixed right away. You got a herniation, you got arm pain. Get it fixed right away. You got a herniation, you got a headache. Get it fixed right away. Why wait? Why wait? The reason why surgeons tell you to wait is because Honestly, I'm not going to butter this up because they suck at surgery and their complication rate is very high and they're afraid they're going to paralyze you or damage your voice box or your esophagus and then you're going to want to sue them and then they're going to get to say, hey, I had to do the surgery. The patient was paralyzed and then the jury's going to go, oh, you're right and that complication you had is just a normal complication of spine surgery. You're right. So they just really, they're just scared and they're incompetent. Okay, yes, I'm making a bold statement and people don't like that, I get it, but it's the absolute truth. I've seen this so many times. Surgeons telling their patients to wait till they're paralyzed before they get surgery. It's crazy. So why wait? The only reason they want you to wait is so that they can be vindicated in the event they have a problem or you have a bad outcome. They just want to be able to say, look, you were paralyzed. I had to do it. But, you know, if you do your surgery properly, the surgery part properly, you're not going to have a complication. As long as you screen the patients medically, you make sure they're healthy, and you do the surgery technique properly, you're not going to have a complication. So, no, I don't agree that people should wait until they're paralyzed before they get their spine fixed. I think that's a... Oh, look at that thing. An old wives' tale. See that herniation right there? It's moving now. It wants to be freed. It is seriously calcified. Look at how calcified it is. It is hard as a rock. And it's sitting there right on top of the nerve. See how much we can do endoscopically, folks? You don't need to do an open surgery. Well, Look at all the mobility of the bones I'm getting just by removing the scar tissue and the herniations and doing the annular debridement. I'm getting a great amount of movement. Still work to be done. 
But no, I do not prescribe to the belief that patients should become neurologically compromised severely before they have surgery. Now, if your surgeon is a horrible surgeon, they have a high complication rate. Let's say their complication rate is 50%. Then yes, you better wait until you're almost paralyzed before you have that surgeon operate on you because if you're already paralyzed, they can't make you worse. That's really what they're looking for, to be honest with you. But a good surgeon knows they're not gonna paralyze their patient and they will uh, be more aggressive at treating them earlier because they know that's what's best for the patient. I don't know if that makes sense. Sometimes I feel like I'm too honest with you guys. Some people aren't gonna be able to take the truth, but my job here is to give it to you. Give you the truth, okay? Truth is, there are a lot of good spine surgeons out there that can actually fix you without waiting for you to go paralyzed so that they don't have to cover up their screw up and say, well, you're paralyzed already anyway, so I didn't make you any worse. Does that make sense, Diego? Am I? I understand. I and know you do. And the patient does too, says thank right. you. Well, that's good. Damn, this is a toughie. I've gotten about 90% of this herniation out of here and there's just a little bit more to get. Um, once again, this is one of those surgeries that's gonna be a long surgery because there's just so much work to be done. I'm basically cleaning out their foramen right now. So, uh, how's my irrigation? This is the last of the foramen. I'm really lateral now. And I'm getting out everything I can. Anybody ever see that movie, Jungle Cruise? All right, so remember what they say about going in the jungle? It's dangerous, you don't wanna go there, there's wild animals, blah, 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 right? But there are people who can navigate you through the jungle safely. They really know what they're doing. It's the same thing with spine surgery. There are surgeons that um, just perform better than others. They're safer, they have better outcomes. And a lot of it has to do with just training on their familiarity and comfort level with using complex, sophisticated equipment like endoscopes, microscopes, you know. And there's a lot of surgeons who are afraid to do surgery. Yes. I mean, what trapeze artist isn't afraid to get up on the high bar and do and perform they all are yes they're trained to do it yes that's their job but that doesn't mean they're not afraid of it of falling and having an accident okay so there's always risks for the operator whatever the operation may be and some operators are better prepared and others are less prepared and the ones that are in their minds, not prepared. Maybe they just have more fear, so they transfer that fear to their patients. It's called transference, by the way. It's a known psychological phenomenon. So what I'm saying is, I hear these stories all the time from my patients that come from elsewhere. They say, oh yeah, the surgeon told me to wait till I 
paralyzed before I have surgery. I'm like, why the hell would you ever do that? Paralysis is permanent. You can't reverse paralysis. It doesn't matter how much money you have and what doctor you go to. There is no reversing paralysis. Now, that may change in the future. They've discovered a new drug that apparently can reverse paralysis of the spinal cord. That was announced just last week, I think. But it's still in the investigational stages. And I don't know if there's much credibility to it. I just saw it in, in the news, but I don't know. I haven't seen the results yet to really know if it's true or not. So don't ask me about it yet. But the truth is paralysis right now is irreversible and it has been, you know. So why would you want to wait? Why would you want to have a patient wait until they're paralyzed before you operate? Yeah. Am I the only one that doesn't make sense to? Luis, am I missing something here? Right? Sorry, it's such a long-winded question and answer, but it just, um, it's just an amazing concept. It's like um, someone being abused domestically. Why would you want to wait till you have a broken bone in your body or maybe maybe a gunshot before you report it to the police and do something about it? That's stupid. It's stupid. It's just stupid old way of thinking about it. And that's why we broadcast because we want people to see there's a better way. You don't wait till the broken bone happens. You don't wait till the gunshot happens. You fix it right away as soon as you identify the problem. And that's what we do here at Duke Spine Institute. Right, Luis? We don't wait till people are paralyzed to operate on them. Some people wait themselves, but we don't make them wait. All right. I need to just get a little more here. And then we're going to be done with this disc. And we'll move on to the next one. I'm totally going out the foramen right now. Um, on the right side. And I'm using my laser to remove this herniation. Oh yeah. That's amazing. There's a piece. This is all ju uh, the jelly from the center of the disc that went out through the tear to the foramen to where the nerves are. And we're removing those pieces because they're sitting on top of the nerve. And this is what's causing this poor man's weakness in his arm. All this hard bone spurs and, I mean, hard uh, herniations just sitting on the nerve in the foramen with the nerve has nowhere to go. This is really hard to get to, by the way. I mean, really, really a struggle here, but... We're getting it. Everything okay, doctor? All right. The nerve is literally just below this foraminal ligament and it's been nicely decompressed. We've made a lot of room for the nerve. By getting rid of all those pieces of herniation that were sitting on top of it. And that's it. We're pretty much done with this level here. I'm going to come out. Oh, maybe I can get a little bit there. Any questions? Have we run the video animation of the actual surgery that we're doing? No, I'll cue it up right now. Why don't you do that? Okay. Disc herniation is a are watching the video. Chronic neck pain. Thank you.
The inflamed annular tear causes neck pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes arm pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. It can take up to 12 months. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Three, two, one. No? No, 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 but I tried. But I, I couldn't. It was yeah, close. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're still in the foramen here at 5.6 on the right. Ooh, look at the size of the herniation that just came out. That was it. That should be the last of them. My God. Phew. Uh, Luis asked me if I tried the VelociCoaster yet. I have tried to go, but um, every time I go to Universal to go on a VelociCoaster, the line is just too long. It's an hour long line. I, I just can't get myself to wait an hour. Oh, that looks good, Luis. That looks clean. <laughs> We're done here at this level. Next, I'm going to move down to the C67. This was a tough one. We knew this would be a tough case because this patient's discs are so degenerated and collapsed. Here's an example of waiting too long, you know? And that he did. He waited way too long, you know? He has atrophy in his hand. That's a really bad sign. He waited for the right surgery and the right team. Luis is right, but I wish he hadn't waited so long. So hard to bring people back when their hands are paralyzed or their legs are paralyzed and they wait so long. I'm really glad somebody asked that question earlier because I think it's a very important issue that needs to be addressed. If you have a herniated disc and you're having pain or any numbness or weakness at all, do not wait. Get it fixed. And if your surgeon won't fix it, get another opinion. Get a surgeon who will. Because fixing it's the right thing to do for you, the patient. And I can tell you right now, if you don't fix it, you're going to suffer and wish you had someday gotten it fixed. We are done with the work. Probably the worst disc, which is C56. Um, Dilator. Damn, man, I was putting a lot of torque on that. Cleany, cleany. Betadine. No, no, that's not betadine. That's uh, discogram. That's my methylene blue. I mean, uh, indigo carmine. I was wondering, it's a little too blue. We need brown. Brown. <laughs> brown, not blue. There we go. So this is an antiseptic we're using called Betadine, developed by NASA for us and the space shuttle program and all space travel. Why? Because they don't want to, the astronauts to go up there and bring home any surprises. We've all seen Alien, right? Nobody wants to bring home an alien. I think we need more. Let's get some more irrigation. Yeah, I can still see there's a little. Some of that's blood, but the rest is. It's running clear. Take. All right, at this point, we're done with one disc. 
And we're going to get started on number two. We'll need to bring our fluoro back in. All right. So I'm going to have to move from one of these discs to the next. And to do that, I have to slide my dilator along the anterior longitudinal ligament. That's not fun to do. Mm -hmm. What the heck was that? Okay, well we need to be careful. All right, looking good. Looking good. I will need a inline traction on the head. I'll need a shoulder pull from Luis and Flynn. Don't pull yet. Just give me a second. Let me just. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. I'm going to take the di the tube out. Leave the dilator in. Shot. Yep. There we go. And put a little pressure. All right, shot. Now, let's see what we can do about this picture. I think you need to be, I don't know. We know we need to go down one disc. Let's just see what we can get before I do anything. Let's give me inline traction. Let's give me shoulder pull now. A little bit of shoulder pull. I don't need a lot. And show me. Shot, beautiful. I think that'll work. I can see that disc pretty well. All right, everybody good where they are? Shot. All right, I'm going to move this out of the disc, and I'm going to move it down the spine. Out and down. Shot. Should be pretty close. There we go. All right. Shot. Now I'm off to the side. I need to know which side. Give me an AP. Well, actually, I may be right in the middle. Give me a coker. Hold on, don't shoot. Shot. All right, we're right in the middle. So it was just a bone spur. Let's go back lateral. Take that. Yeah, baby. Shot, that's it right there. Shot. All right, I'm going to come south. Shot. 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 AP. Everyone hold. Tell me when you're ready to shoot the AP. Shot. Oh, come on. That's good. Lateral. Take this. Nice and gentle, guys. Nice and gentle. All right, we're there. Mallet. Uh, do you have time for a question, Dr. Duke? Shot. Not yet. In about 30 seconds, yes. Shot. All right, let's back things up. I want to see I want to see the entire spine at C2 down. Pressure here, Luis, just a little gentle pressure. Let me just see. I need to see C2. All right. Uh, just a little bit more of C2. All right, C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Everyone agree? 6, 7. That's the bottom disc we're fixing, 6, 7. Everyone's in agreement. So basically, we're at C6, 7. That's good. I will need to see C6, 7. I want to do a, hopefully, a discogram. 
So I'm going to set this up for a discogram done through the dilator. That's my own little technique. All right. Let's get, I, yeah, you can come off there. Let's get a shoulder pull, slight head traction. Tell me when you're ready. Give me a shot. Yeah, give me a shot. All right, that's good. Shot. There's the die. Beautiful. A nice tear in the back of the disc. You could see it. Take, take. I need a mallet. I'm going to bring this dilator to the back of the disc. Can you give me a better picture of the back of the disc, Jordan? You know, surprising to me, this patient's MRI just looks horrible with degenerative disc, disc collapse, bone spur. But his discs are actually pretty supple still, Sean. Like, this thing moves through them pretty nicely. I've had some really degenerated discs where, um, yeah, where I could not advance the dilator at all. That's perfect. And it was so scarred inside the whole disc. The whole disc was scarred up. But now for this disc, the front's still very, very nice, very functional, very soft. But the back is where the problem is. All right. So I have a tendency to rest my arm on my patient's chest. So they wake up afterwards, they go, hey, my neck feels great, but for some reason my ribs hurt. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sorry about that. I was leaning on you a little bit. But anyway, that said, this is, the whole surgery is done through this tube. Now, take a picture of this, folks, with your, with your, fo with your camera. Okay, take your, uh, your iPhone out or your Android or whatever you got someday your Tesla phone. Snap a picture of this and show it to your uh, spine surgeon that's setting you up for an ACDF and say, hey doctor, can you do my entire three disc ACDF through this tube? He's going to think you uh, are crazy and you're going to say, well, I just watched the neurosurgeon do it and he didn't use any metal plates or screws or cages. Uh, why can't you do it? See what he says, he or she says. I'm not trying to be sexist here, but ask that neurosurgeon or orthopedic spine surgeon why they can't do this. And see what the first words out of their mouth are. All right, I need to see that part of the spine. Can you help me, Sean? I need a little shoulder pull, a little neck traction. That's beautiful. Give me the mallet and the in inducer, persuader, compactor, the what's he? All right, that looks good. We're going to advance the tube through the disc without moving the dilator. Shot. Remember, we don't got to watch the tip of the dilator. That's the most important thing. You cannot let it go back into the spinal cord. She's given some more muscle relaxer, which is really helping because I can feel this thing widen the disc, spread the bones, and there's no resistance to it right now. Sean, that's because the anesthesiologist has been using her brain and thinking ahead and saying, okay, he's about to put the tube in. He's gonna spread those bones apart. The muscles will contract. Yes, of course, we're done the muscles will contract to squeeze the bones together and block him from advancing. So she anticipated this and gave more muscle relaxer, which has helped. Now look at the tube on the x-ray. Show the tip of the tube there with your arrow. That's it, C67, there's the bottom of the tube. We are literally sitting right where the herniation is. So I'm gonna put my scope down there and we're gonna see the herniation and we're gonna laser and grab it out. And that's why this is the most incredible surgery in the world. There's literally only one surgeon in the United States that does this, that's me, here at Duke Spine Institute, that does endoscopic anterior cervical transdiscal with annular debridement. I will say, Americans and world, that the Asian countries are already using endoscopic spine surgery and they're teaching it at the universities. They're 
far less reliant on fusions and metal because they don't have the money to pay off the big implant companies that sell the metal. So those companies aren't really marketing their metal in those countries because they're not, they can't make huge profits like they can in developed countries like the United States, England, Australia, uh, and other developed European countries where the um, companies that sell the metal, they have a stranglehold on the market and on the education of surgeons. <clears throat> okay, so the Chinese are actually getting far more advanced along with the Koreans at doing endoscopic surgery that doesn't involve expensive implants because it's cost effective and, and it works better than, than fusions do. All right, Duke, you ready for the question? I'm ready for questions. All right. How do you protect the nerves and blood vessels while you're doing the surgery? How do I protect the nerves and blood vessels while doing the surgery? That's a great question. So first of all, lesson one, one, 101, the disc, the spinal disc has no blood supply and it has no nerves. Okay, so there are no nerves where I am passing through but the nerves and blood supply start at the back of the herniation. And we will see the blood supply. There's a herniated piece right there. I just floated it out. There's another piece of herniation right there, floating it out. Um, so there are no nerves and blood supply where, I'm, where I am with the tube. However, as I get to the annular tear and I start working to the periphery of it, I will get into blood supply and, and nerves. And basically knowing where they are is the most important way to protect them, okay? And I know exactly where they are. They're deep to where I am. In other words, they're down there below that material that I'm working on. They're down below it, okay? They're below all this stuff. So using the x-ray machine and knowing my anatomy and making sure that the laser doesn't go in too deep or too far. All those things are important to protecting. Look at that herniation, holy macazoid. Look at that thing. It just came right out of the epidural space, right where the spinal cord and nerve are. Look at how degenerated this patient's discs are on the MRI and look at how much soft jelly disc there still is. Um, you might be inclined to believe there's no disc left, but there is, there's quite a bit. But these surgeons that wanna do fusions, they'll try to convince you that the disc is degenerated, it needs to be removed for you to have good long-term result. They are either lying to you or they're lying to you. <laughs> what I mean is they either know they're lying to you or they don't know they're lying to you, but they're lying to you either way. You do not need to take the whole disc out. You do not need to do a fusion. I'll show you the spinal cord is literally just a few millimeters away from where I'm working deep. And I'm staying away from it because I can't see it very well right now. So I'm not even going to go near it. This is all herniation, herniation, all herniation it keeps filling up popping in like right there there's a herniated piece so this patient's got a lot of herniated disc back here and i've just got to take it all out piece by piece okay we have another question when you're ready sure, i'll take the question okay in the case of a spinal cord compression how do you work around the disc that is directly above the dura well, I am doing that right now. So in the case of spinal cord compression, how do you work uh, in the disc right above the dura where the spinal cord is? That's what I'm doing. I'm able to do it because I'm approaching it. My God, look at all these herniated pieces. I'm able to do it because I'm approaching the spinal cord top down. And it's like I'm crawling towards it slowly and making sure I can see it when I encounter it. I don't know if that makes sense. Imagine if you were eating a pie and the bottom of the pie, the crust, was the spinal cord. You start at the top, you kind of flick the 
the crust off and then you start to eat the filling slowly and you're just really careful as you're eating the filling and going down so you when you when you get to the bottom crust which is the spinal cord you you're kind of prepared because you sort of know how deep it is normally and you know where it's located and you slowly peel away a little bit of the filling at a time so you're not causing any damage to the spinal cord that's essentially what i'm doing here look at the size of this herniation it's like a giant manatee just sitting there saying leave me alone i'm eating the seaweed but that whole thing is a herniation right there i'm going to try to grab it out but i don't think i'm going to get it because it's bigger than the tube and I'm going to have to, what we say, bivalve it, bivalving. You know what I'm talking about, Rita? Sorry, bi bivalve. Bivalve. Anybody know? Shit, it's not coming out. Bivalve. You all know what a bivalve is, right? Mollusks, mussels, clams. Those are bivalves. They have two halves. I have to cut it in half. Ah, where's my irrigation? There it is. Got it. I'm going to have to cut this thing in half. And not a happy day. Oh, yeah. Look at that thing jiggle. See it? Oh, yeah, come on. Now I might be able to get that. It's kind of fun. If you like playing video games, being a neurosurgeon is kind of fun because you actually get paid to play video games. <laughs> right? You, you're looking at a screen all day if you're an endoscopic surgeon. And you're, um, you're actually, this is a level boss right here. Anybody know what a level boss is? This is a level boss. I'm up against the level boss right now. Okay. I hope some of you know what a level boss is. I don't want to have to explain it. <laughs> Rita, will you explain to our audience what a level boss is, please? <laughs> Do you know? Uh, if you know what a level boss is, you're truly a gamer. And you're a, a gamer like me, a long time ago gamer. Because I don't even know if they have level bosses. I think they do. Oh, that's such a big herniation. That's crazy. Look at the size of that thing. It's a behemoth. Look at it. It looks like an alien. Look at that herniation. I'm wiggling it out with the tube. That's pretty cool, huh? All right. It's a geek moment. A geek moment. Did I get it? Nope. Oh, it doesn't want to come out. It's too damn big. It's hitting the, the bottom of the tube and just not coming through. So thank God. You know what I'm going to say right now, Luis? What am I going to say? Diego? No. Oh, my God. You guys are horrible. Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> you want some of me, huh? This thing is a is like a polar bear. Seriously, look at there it is there all the way over there somewhere it disappears. I need to grab this thing out. This thing is driving me crazy. I want to pull it out as one giant piece. I'm gonna try one more time. If not, I'm just gonna have to mercilessly attack it. Oh, I felt like it wanted to come, but then it stopped. Damn it. Oh well, I'm gonna have to do it the hard way. Target practice. All right, well, let's just take it out little by little then. Hmm. 
You guys hear about the elephant in the room, right? This is the elephant in the room. It's literally a monster herniation. This is at C67, the bottom disc. And again, I'm just cutting it in half. Oh, there's a piece that wants to come. Come on now. Oh yeah, there we go, baby. So we just separated the mother from her cub, polar bear. Do we not have any questions on by our viewers or what? Uh, we have one question. It's, uh, can the patient suffer a nerve defect by using the laser and not fusion? Can this patient suffer a nerve defect? Yes. By using the laser and not fusion? Mm hmm All right. Let's talk about the things that could cause the patient to suffer a nerve defect during surgery. With a fusion, you have the screws being put in that can cause a nerve defect. You have a metal plate that could cause a nerve defect. You have metal instruments like a curette or a pituitary rondeur that could cause nerve defects. How many is that so far? Plate, screws, curette, pituitary rongeur. That's four, right? Then you got a drill, five. And then you got a cage, six. And then you got bone graft, seven. And of course, if you break the bone graft into morselized autograft versus DBM, that's really seven and eight. And then you've got. Um, Kerosin Rongeur, nine. Uh, and then, of course, you've got retractors, ten. Pituitary, I mean, not pituitary, but um, what is it called? Penfield, number four, and number one. I'm lost. Is that 12? So far, 12 things that could cause a nerve injury with the fusion surgery. With the laser surgery, you've got the dilator, you've got the uh, tube, the laser, and the pituitary. I think four things. Four things that might cause nerve damage, which of course none of them ever do, as long as they're handled properly. But then again, I've done over a thousand ACDF fusions on the neck without nerve damage either. So I would say the chance of causing nerve damage is much higher with a fusion, much higher. Because you can't see what you're doing down by the nerves with a fusion. You see here, what you're seeing is literally the right on top of the nerve. With a fusion, you don't get this view. This is an endoscopic view. Without the endoscope, this is a dark, deep hole. And somewhere down there is a nerve. But with the endoscope, it's bright and we can see everything. So the chance of nerve damage is far greater in a fusion surgery than in an endoscopic. There's another piece of that herniation. I'm going to try to grab that guy out. It's just taunting me. No, we're good. You want to shed some light on it? All right, yeah, that, that's good because our audience can actually see what I'm doing, which is grabbing and trying to get the, the polar bear out, but unsuccessful because it's still there. I just couldn't get it. It's too big. So I'm gonna have to break it up again. The laser is very good at that, breaking things up into pieces. We call that vaporizing. Oh, there goes a piece right there. Just separated another cub from the mother polar bear. I'm starting to feel bad about it. But you know, polar bears are not nice creatures normally. They're nice to look at, but not nice to interact with. And this polar bear is interacting with my patient's nerve root in a bad way. So I am not happy about that. Right, Luis? Oh my gosh, look at all this herniation down here. This is C67. We are literally at the back of the disc. The, all these herniations you're seeing, they're all blown out. They're out of place, okay? 
They cannot be put back in the disc and reused. It's impossible. But just to give you an idea, even though it looks like a lot of herniation of jelly from the center, it represents about 5% of this patient's entire disc. That's nothing. 5%, you can live without 5% of your disc. Easy. So going in and removing all this stuff, people think, oh my gosh, I got to put it back. You don't. All right? You don't. You, the patient won't miss it. And it's already gone anyway, by the way. So the problem, folks, is that to get back here, every other spine surgeon on the face of the earth that doesn't do endoscopic surgery like I do, which is them all, they all have to scrape the entire front of the disc out to get to the pieces in the back. And that's why a fusion is necessary at the end of the surgery when you do an ACDF. It's because the surgeon has to remove the front of the disc to get to the back. And when you start removing the front of the disc, well, there's nothing else you could put back in here except for something that's plastic or metal, like an artificial disc. But look at the view we've got. Wow. Incredible. Huh? What a view. It's so cool. No neurosurgeon gets to see this unless they do endoscopic surgery. And there is nobody else that does it in the front of the neck or the thoracic but me. The Koreans do this over in Korea. The Chinese are starting to do some. But when I say the Koreans, I have to tell you, it's not all of them. There's only a few of us in the world that know how to do this. Of all the world spine surgeons, if I had to guess, I'd say there's probably 10 in the world that do cervical. And I'm the only one that does thoracic. And then there's far more that do lumbar, lower back. Uh, Dr. Duke? Yeah. Oh, yeah. look at that. No wonder what's pressing on his nerve, huh? Look at the size of these herniations. Yes. Yeah, we have a question from YouTube. Can the laser fix kyphosis? Can the laser fix kyphosis? Yep. Oh, I love these questions. I love it. I love it. I almost want to challenge people to think about how that, that could, the laser could fix kyphosis. The answer is yes, and the answer is no. Oh, it must be circumstantial. That is correct. It is circumstantial. How does the laser fix kyphosis? The million dollar question. I will put it out there. Let's see who can answer that question besides me of my audience. And I will allow my, even my staff to answer this question if they can. Depends on the degree of kyphosis. That is a good, solid answer, but I cannot give you that as the credit for the answer. What you really have to ask yourself is what's causing the kyphosis? Are there causes of kyphosis that the laser can fix? Do, 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 do. Have you ever seen an MRI where there is kyphosis and the radiologist says, kyphosis of the cervical spine, most likely related to muscle spasms? Have you ever heard that? All the time. Why? What are muscle spasms? Well, they hurt like hell. Why is the patient having muscle spasms? Because they have a herniated disc causing pain. And that pain then causes the muscle spasm. Look at that thing. It's another beast of a herniation. What am I going to do with you? I think I found a cave full of polar bears here. Yeah. Just in time for winter. The, the patient says it's congenital. Congenital kyphosis. Yes. Hmm. You know what congenital means? It means you're born with it. Honestly, don't know too many people born with kyphosis. As a matter of fact, the truth is... This patient would be the first I've ever met in my life, born with kyphosis. Congenital kyphosis means you're born with it. I've heard of congenital scoliosis. I've seen it, but I've never seen congenital kyphosis. So what I'm getting at is kyphosis that's due to pain in the neck that causes muscle spasms 
can be fixed with this surgery. Yes. But kyphosis that's caused by a fracture of the vertebrae throwing the spine out of alignment, that cannot be fixed. But most cervical kyphosis is due to pain. So I would say the answer is yes, but it's qualified if the kyphosis is due to muscle spasms from neck pain, which, by the way, is about 70% of the time, if I had to put a number on it. So I would say 70% of the time, the Duke laser disc repair could correct kyphosis by eliminating, mus by eliminating disc pain, and which in turn eliminates muscle spasms, which in turn eliminates kyphosis. That's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, the viewer says that they and their identical twin has it. They and what? Their identical twin. Ah. Both have that. Well, my friend, send me your MRI, and I will look at it for, for, for you. No charge. And if you want to send me the identical twins, I'll look at that too. Feel free to send it in. We'll look at it, and I'll tell you if we can fix it with the laser or not. Great question. Ready for another one? I'm ready for more. Okay, cool. I'm just warming up. Can you repair a longitudinal ligament that holds it up? Can I repair a longitudinal ligament? Yes. That does what now? That holds it up. That's what the question says. Diego, you're... You're working your magical voice where you say something but trail off as oh. you say it. Longitudinal ligament. That's what they asked. <laughs> Am I imagining? Huh? We heard longitudinal ligament. No, that's it. That's it. That's the, that's the question. Can I repair a longitudinal ligament? Yes. Um, I've never encountered a patient in my entire career of 25 years that needed a longitudinal ligament repaired. So I'm just wondering, what, what is the situation here? Has someone told you you need a longitudinal ligament repaired? Because I'm, I'm a little bit miffed. I'm miffed, but not muffed. Can you tell me? Uh, they said, with regards to a kyphosis repair. Ah, with regards to a kyphosis repair. Yes. Uh-huh. No. That would have to be done with open surgery, most likely. I'm not familiar with fixing a longitudinal ligament endoscopically. I'm not saying I couldn't do it someday, but... I, uh, I've never done it, and I would have to uh, really look at it carefully and see if that's something that I'd want to do. Um, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. I'm just, I'd have to be convinced that it would work and that it's the right thing for this person that wants it done. I don't just do surgeries that people request. I do surgeries that people need. And I'm not saying you don't need it by any means. I'm just saying that I've never encountered a patient that needs longitudinal ligament surgery. And I've been doing spine surgery for a long time. It doesn't mean that I haven't, I, uh, there's things out there I haven't encountered. I'm not that arrogant. I truly believe there may be a need for it, but I would have to be convinced that that would benefit you, the patient. Uh, before I would ever do something like that. I hope you understand. Nothing personal. I just, uh, I don't believe in doing anything that doesn't work. But I'm not opposed to trying new things that do work. Um, anything that works, I'd be happy to try. All right, we have gone way out the frame in over here on the right. Now I've got to 
make my way off to the other side. That IV pole, doctor, if there's a way to lower it, it would be most helpful to me. Sort of blocking my view. Uh, we have another question for Dr. Duke. Yes. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about long fusions? Uh, they're getting recommended a T8 to their sacrum for scoliosis. Oh God. 100% no. No, no, no. Whoever is asking about long fusion, T8 to the sacrum. Long fusions are wonderful if you're the surgeon and you've got a mortgage payment to make or if you've got a new Mercedes to buy. Um, but they're horrible for patients. Look, I mean, I say that tongue in cheek, obviously. I don't mean to be insensitive, but I really need to see you and I need to examine you to tell you if, that, if I agree with a surgery like that. But I have never done a surgery like that. And there's a reason I've never done it because it's unnecessary. I'm uh, out of ear, something about the irrigation. That was weird. Yeah, I see it's coming now. So my answer is just that I've, honest to God, uh, I hear about these surgeries. I see the patients who get them done because they develop problems afterwards at it, what's called the adjacent segment below the fusion, you know, in, in the lower back. But since you're going to the sacrum, your problem would be the sacroiliac joint, the SI joint. You would get sacroiliitis, sacroiliac joint instability. My point is, I have never found a patient that needs it. Yes, there's lots of people with long segment scoliosis, but the truth is, is that they don't need that surgery because their pain is focal. In other words, it's localized to a specific area. And if you just treat that area, you can get rid of their pain without doing the massive surgery. So what I would say to you is let me see your films and let me interview you on Zoom, and I will tell you if I agree with the surgery. Now, if you've got a horrible, horrible curve, and it's progressing, you know, it's 30 degrees or more, and it's progressing. You know, if you're at a 50 degree, 60 degree curve, and it's getting worse and worse and worse quickly, then yeah, you might need a long segment fusion, you know, but it's so rare that I see patients that need that, that literally I, I could count you on one finger if, um, if that's the case. So typically we see scoliosis patients at Duke Spine. I do lots of scoliosis surgery, lots and lots and lots and lots, as much as anybody, mostly degenerative scoliosis, okay? Not idiopathic juvenile, but degenerative adult scoliosis. And if you're an adult and you have scoliosis, it's, it's a degenerative scoliosis is most likely what you have. That we can fix with this surgery right here by just treating the painful discs in the scoliosis that are causing your pain. You understand? You don't need the fusion. I've not had to do fusions lately with scoliosis. I've been able to, to treat the patient's pain and get rid of it with just this type of surgery. And it's so much nicer not having to undergo a major surgery to get rid of your pain. Look at the view here. This is amazing. This scope is amazing, Luis. Did they? Did we have this rebuilt? Uh, I believe that's one of them. That's one of them. They've done a great job with the fiber optics. Yeah. My God, it almost looks like a rod lens scope. I mean, that's impressive. I'm very happy with that result. All right, we're just about done here. This again is a long surgery. We got one more to go. So one more disc, and one more surgery. I told you our um, lumbar surgery already left an hour ago. She was doing absolutely fantastic. We'll do a testimonial tomorrow for her when she comes back to see me and get her wound checked. And um, yeah, she's doing great. She's a work comp, by the way. We do take workman's comp here and we get a lot of workman's comp patients because work comp smart. The laser surgery is cheaper than a fusion and the patients go back to work right away. So they want the patients, we're done here. They want the patient to, uh, to have a less invasive, faster recovery, less expensive surgery. <laughs> Launch. <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry about the freight train coming through the operating room there. All right. My kids say my jokes are not funny. That doesn't mean you have to agree with my kids. Right, Rita? I mean, after all, the money I pay you guys, you should be laughing at all my jokes. Right, Jordan? And Jordan's like, I, I do. You just can't hear me because I'm wearing a mask and I'm off in the corner. What's that? You don't want to laugh too loud and disrupt me? That's an intelligent answer. I like that, Flynn. I like that. All right, we are done with two out of three discs. We, oh, who has the scope on? You guys got to turn the scope off. We're out. We don't want to burn out the light or melt the fibers. Okay. Hi. We are just going to uh, finish up. We have one more disc. It's the uh, four five at the top of the spine. I've got a is the laser on? No, sir. It just, uh, yeah. It's just it's the red light, light yeah. pointing at my forehead. Yeah. No big deal. <laughs> right? I mean, I feel like someone's pointing a machine gun at me, but worse, a laser. <laughs> Look, you got to have some fun in the operating room. Look, I, you know, the truth is, is that everyone thinks that what happens in the operating room like is like in the movies, you know? But the operating room, this is a real operating room. So what you see is what you get. Normally we play music, but then Facebook kicks us because then we're playing some music that they're saying we're not allowed to play. All right, is that our shot there? All right, this is gonna be fun. All right, shot. I will need a little uh, neck traction thing. Two, three, four, five. And a little shoulder pull in a moment. Shot, let's see where we are. Yep, that's good. All right, so let's just wait a minute. And relax, everybody. Relax, relax, relax. I'm going to move this in a moment. Everyone catch their breath. Stretch. I'm just applying a little pressure because we're going to come out of this. Are you ready, doctor? Is that a yes? All right. I'm ready. Let's get going then. Shot. Oh yeah, we're out. Shot. All right, uh, I need to move. I need to get an AP. Poker. Perfect, lateral. So I'm looking for the tip to be on the spinous process, which it is. And of course, I want the spinous process in the middle of the vertebrae, which that's why you got to line things up. Now I'm back in the disc that I was in before right there. You see that? That is the five, six. So I'm in five, six. I just popped through that little anterior annulotomy defect and I'm going to go up one more level. That next level Two, three, four, five, six. I'm is going to be four, five. We want to get up to the next disc at four, five. You ready? I, I don't really need a shoulder pull. Are you okay there, doctor? All right. You can just, um, if you don't mind staying there, I'm going to be done in just a minute. Shot. 
I need an AP. Try to give me a real AP shot. Uh, still rotated. Give me a little unrotated AP. Slightly rotated. Give me a little unrotated. That's better, but give me more shot. That's pretty good. All right, go lateral. I'm in the middle. That's where I need to be. I need to get up to this last disc space. I'm just about there. And once I get there, then I can... Uh, do the next disc, which is the four five shot. Shot. Feeling the bone spur. Got to come up the bone spur. Shot. Shot. All right, I need an AP coker. Just stay where you are, doctor. We're almost done. I got to tell you, this is probably the hardest part of the whole surgery. And it is something that is extremely difficult to do. Hold on now. Just nobody move. Shot. Uh-huh. Lateral. It's looking pretty darn good right there. Almost done, doctor. Oh my God, I love it. Two, three, four, five, everyone agree? Yes, sir. Perfect shot. Take, wait, wait, wait. shot, <clears throat> yeah. Shot, Dr. Rafferty, you're done. Take, all right, we are in the four, five disc. I'm gonna pipe clean it, shot. Is that it right there? Shot? Shot? That's it? Shot? Shot? My God, there's a lot of crud in there. Shot? Did you clean this thing out? Shot? Are you registering an image? Yeah, shot? Sure looks like you're right. You're registering. Shot? Shot? I just feels like there's... We need to clean this thing out, Sean. Just about there. There we go. That should be it. All right, good. So now we're going to do our discogram. Ow. Just kidding. Dr. Rafferty, I love your eyes. They're so cool and collected, like icicles. Not bad, huh? Not bad for an old timer like me, Sean. All right, it's hard to see the material, but it's there. Sean, I just gave it a little more. Look at the double disc herniations there. It looks like at the disc, yeah. It looks like uh, Wonder Woman's character from Marvel Comics. <laughs> it's getting late in the day, so I get to make cheesy jokes. <clears throat> I do like the Wonder Woman character a lot. All right. Okay, so we're right in the herniation now with the tip of this dilator. But did you see how it, it pushed it out? As soon as I let go, it got shot. It, look, it pushed it out again. <laughs> see what I mean? Some of these discs, they just literally push the dilator out. There's so much intradiscal pressure from the inflammation. All right, shot. So I'm going to have to re-advance it. and get this tube in shot all right tube is where i want it i mean to start with at least it's not where i want it in the final position shot the dilator will come backwards as i do this shot okay that one went forward shot making me look bad shot Again, you want to advance this tube over the dilator, but slowly. You want to make sure that the tip of the dilator doesn't go through, um, you know, into the spinal canal where the spinal cord is. 
So I'm just slowly advancing it, keeping an eye on the tip of the dilator. That time it went forward a little bit. Shot. 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 All right, this should be it right there. Perfect. So the note, notice the back of the tube is in line with the back of the vertebral body. That's perfect positioning. We're set up to do our last disc. And so far what we've seen are, despite the fact this gentleman has degenerative disc disease with pretty collapsed discs, there are huge herniations back there. And they were pushing on the nerves really bad causing all kinds of symptoms for the patient. And if you missed it earlier, his right hand is just completely paralyzed. He's got all the muscles are gone, tremendous atrophy, can't use his hand. And I wish he hadn't waited so long. You know, when people get to that much atrophy, it's really hard to regenerate because what happens is when you have a pinched nerve in your neck, the nerve will grow back down the little axons will grow down the nerve fiber to the muscle, but the muscle has to call them. And if there's no muscle because it's all gone, it, it can't call the nerves down. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's an interplay between the growing nerve fiber once the decompression is done and the muscle down in the hand, but the muscle in the hand is like 90% gone, so it has a little voice it can't really call the nerve down. And what it really uses are, of course, cytokines and nerve growth factors that releases on the terminus of the nerves at the neuromuscular junction. So the longer you wait to get your pinched nerve fixed, the less likely it's gonna recover. <clears throat> so I don't know if he's gonna get better, but I told him he needs to have this done because if he doesn't, he's just going to lose complete function of his entire arm. And that's worse than what he's got now. So, I really hope he gets better. This is definitely the right thing to do, you know, to decompress the root. I, I don't know what happened to this patient's discs, but they are so badly damaged. There's so much herniation. Each of these pieces coming out is a herniation. Each of these pieces represents another piece of jelly squeezed out onto the nerve. So every time, there's a big one right there. Too big to come out. I'm going to have to break it up. Looks like a sea anemone. Oh yeah, there's another piece. All right, so we've shown the video animation of how herniated discs cause pain in the neck, even headaches and arm symptoms. How about the video showing how the laser surgery in the neck works? We showed that too, right? Uh, yes, we did. Now we're just missing the fusion. Let's show the Duke Laser Disc Repair cervical one more time for those people who came in late. Maybe they missed it. Let's show them what it is we're doing here. Okay. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic neck pain. The inflamed annular tear causes neck pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes arm pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. It can take up to 12 months. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com.
fun. Hi, Dr. Duke Majin, back with you after watching that animation on the Duke Laser Disc Repair and how it works. So we're here, we were just talking about removing pieces of herniations like that. And um, once again, I want to highlight the fact that most herniations are not one piece, there are actually many pieces. And because herniations don't just happen at one time, they happen over many times in people's lifetime. Um, it's rare, I mean, literally one in a thousand patients that come to me with one herniation. Uh, virtually everybody comes and they have multiple pieces. So each piece represents a separate event, okay? So this has been going on for a while and uh, a lot of people herniate and then they kind of leave it alone and hope it gets better and then they herniate again and pretty soon they got a pretty good collection of fragments of disc herniation just piling up inside their disc in the back of it right where the tear is. What blows me away to the most is how little spine surgeons and spine doctors actually know about all this. Nobody really pays attention to the disc. It's pretty much forgotten about. And uh, the reality is it's the source of the most common cause of medical problems in the world. Neck and back pain from a herniated disc. Chronic pain, chronic spine pain. And yet it's ignored by everyone. Incredible. That's really the story. Probably because most people don't realize it causes so much symptoms, but also because they don't know what to do with it. Well, we know what to do with it. Fix it. That's what we're doing today. This is our last disc we'll be fixing in this patient. And then we're gonna get the next patient who actually has a lumbar Duke laser disc repair. Two discs we'll be fixing in that patient. And then uh, we'll be done. So my dogs are starting to bark. All right, ask me questions, folks. Otherwise, I start telling terrible jokes. All right, we have uh, another question from Facebook. Uh, our patient says they have bulging discs at L3, 4, and 4, 5. Uh, they want to know, can this be done without fusion? Yes, yeah. So uh, bulging disc, L3, 4, L4, 5, I presume you're having pain in your back and maybe even in your leg. Uh, but we can get rid of that back pain and leg symptoms with surgery. You do not want a fusion. You do not want an artificial disc. They're far too invasive and complications and pain and suffering and downtime. The laser surgery we're doing right now is the perfect solution. Actually, this is on someone's neck, but the one we did earlier was on a person's back. And as a matter of fact, it was an L3-4 and L4-5, just like you. So yeah. Yeah, you don't need a fusion, folks. You don't need a fusion. You just need to have the disc repaired endoscopically with the laser surgery that we do here at Duke Spine. And that should take the pain away. What's different about our surgery? We debride the annular tear. Nobody else does that because nobody else knows about it doing it. So they don't know to do it. Um, they're not going to do it. Right? So... Annular debridement is key. It's the key to eliminating the back pain. It's the key to getting the disc to heal after a herniation. And there's only one place in the world you can get an annular debridement. That's right here at Duke Spine Institute. As a matter of fact, that's what I'm doing at this very moment, but I'm doing it in somebody's neck. Uh, they have three herniated discs in their neck. This is the annular tear you're seeing and I'm cleaning it up with a laser so that it'll heal properly. 
right here. This is all scar tissue from inflammation. I need uh, probably 10 minutes and I'll be done. I have to tell my anesthesiologist that because she's got to start adjusting the um, sleeping gases. We call them uh, volatile anesthetics. Oh, please come out. I'm going to go get you now. You know, why can't a herniation just know when it's beat? Right, Louise? And just come out. Don't make it difficult. We're like the herniation police. Put your hands behind your back. Please come quietly. Do not resist the rest. I don't know if that's a good thing. I personally like the police, especially their song, Every Breath You Take, Every Move You Make. Uh, Dr. Duke, yeah. uh, the, our last commenter said that they have cysts on L4 or 5. Cysts? Yes. Can that be fixed without fusion? Can cysts be fixed without fusion? It depends. I need to see them. If they're small cysts, they can be left alone. If they're large synovial cysts... Yeah, they're, they're the one synovial. They're what? Synovial? Yeah, synovial. Yeah, that one's. Yeah, if they're large synovial cysts that are causing nerve root compression and damage, they need to be excised. Um, usually you have to fuse after that. And uh, just to make sure they don't come back, you've got to remove the facet joint itself. So key is I need to see the cysts, if you want my opinion. Small cysts, you don't need fusion. Large cysts, you do. And the definition of small and large, that's uh, something that I can't tell you over the, over the internet. I have to look at it. It also depends on where it's located. So a cyst that's on top of the nerve is going to cause more problems and need a more aggressive treatment. A cyst that is away from the nerves generally can be treated less aggressively. Just about done, five minutes I think. There's more herniation than I thought. It just keeps coming. You see all this stuff here? It's like crab meat. That's the herniation. Okay, I think five minutes though. I'm gonna show you folks that we did three disc herniations with a four millimeter incision. Four millimeter. No metal, no fusion, no cadaver bone, no cages, no hospitalization. This is outpatient surgery. This patient will go home in an hour from now. Okay? Can't drive themselves home, but they've got somebody to take them home. They're gonna recover overnight and by tomorrow, I think his symptoms are going to be dramatically better. Thank you, Jordan. I'm sure of it. And by the way, all of our patients get a copy of their surgery so they can watch it, see what I did, what I didn't do. <laughs> Some people are funny. All right. Great questions today, by the way, from our audience. Love them. Love questions. Means people are thinking, caring, wanting answers. It's good. Very good. We want to give you your answers that you want, that you want to know. Everything you want to know about the spine. Now, do I have all the answers? Not all of them. I'll tell you if I don't have an answer. There are things I don't know. Sure, absolutely. One of the things I see a lot on the internet these days, which is a bit surprising, is look at that herniation. My God, that's big. Is uh, people talking about having vertigo with a herniated disc in the neck. Oh, I think I got to grab that out. You know, I've, I've never put vertigo with a herniated disc, but it's amazing how many people are saying they have vertigo with a herniated disc. 
I guess what I'd like to know is, does the vertigo go away after the herniated disc is removed? That's really a great question. Now, in my patients, I've never had a patient that had the vertigo go away. Um, but then again, I haven't had any patients expecting the vertigo to go away. So I tell people don't expect the vertigo to go away. But I'd be curious to see, is there really an association of vertigo with disc herniation? Are you aware of anything, Dr. Rafferty? Have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. A last patient had all the Chiari malformation. So she had vertigo from that. Yeah, right. Chiari malformation, but... And she had cervical disc surgery in the past, too. But I don't know whether that was from either more from the internal Chiari malformation or the disc surgery. Yeah, and I always look for Chiari malformations to see. And if I see one, I note it, you know. But I'm, I'm just talking straight up disc herniations. But you've not seen vertigo from that, me either. Doesn't mean it can't happen. It just means I've never seen that vertigo from a herniated disc. But there are people who swear by it. Now, do they get better after spine surgery? I, I haven't heard that. I've been looking. But I haven't actually seen that happen. All right. Uh, we have another question, doctor. Yes. Can you explain what a fecal sac is? What a fecal sac is? Yes. Yeah. The fecal sac is the dura covering over the uh, nerves. It's uh, the dura, the extension of the dura down, usually into the lumbar regions. It's called the fecal sac. It's filled with spinal fluid and nerves. I don't know if that is the answer you're looking for, but that's what it is. You have anything to add, Dr. Rafferty? Luis? No, oh, that's it. All right, done. Lights off, please. Now, if you have questions, type them up. I'll be happy to answer them for you. I'm going to head over to the broadcasting room and uh, Diego will ask me the questions and I'll answer them for you face to face. Before we do that though, I want to show you the amazing incision for this surgery, how small it is. Because it's tiny, four millimeters. Three levels of ACDF. We didn't even do the ACDF. We just did the Duke laser disc repair. It's basically everything an ACDF is and more minus the fusion, minus the implants, minus the big incision, minus the scar tissue, minus the trouble swallowing, minus the hoarseness, minus the scar scarring of the esophagus to the plate. Oh my God, minus the bleeding, minus the narcotics. How many minuses is that? All right. So for those of you who don't know, I just want to show you this. Come on over and take a look. You see this, Diego? Yes, we see it. Patient's face here. They're looking up right at your camera. The chest is here. Collarbone here. This is the neck center. We're off to the left side. I've made this four millimeter cut. You see that? The whole surgery was done through this little tube. We're going to take the tube out and I will show you the incision. I want to apply just a little pressure in case there's some bleeding. Please don't try this at home. I know it looks like I just stick things in people's necks, but trust me, I don't. <laughs> it takes a little more skill than that. <laughs> By the way, this patient has kyphosis. Show them the MRI at the beginning, and you can see the kyphosis this patient has. Now, will that kyphosis go away? Probably, because I think most of that kyphosis is due to muscle spasms from um, the herniations. We certainly aren't going to make it worse. Are
Are you ready? Are you all ready to see this incision? How's that for an incision? You all see that? Can yep. you see that? Yes. Three discs fixed with that incision. Incredible. Only at Duke Spine Institute. Hope you enjoyed the surgery. Write up your questions for me. I'm going to head over to the broadcast room and I'm going to answer your questions for you face to face and try not to make any funny faces at you. We got one more surgery, a two level. Hey, Luis. These With world-class physicians on staff, the newest and most advanced technology, Duke Spine Institute has performed thousands of procedures and achieves a 95% success rate in elimination of pain. Treatments? Every patient comes to us with a unique set of challenges. That's why we address every patient's care individually. These are some of the world-class treatment options available at Duke Spine Institute. Duke Laser Disc Repair, Duke Spinal Fusion, Rhizotomy, Epidural Injection, Kyphoplasty, physical therapy. Meet Dr. Duke, world-renowned board-certified neurosurgeon. Go to www.mri.dukespine.com. Click the free MRI review tab on the upper right. Complete the patient information form. Continue to fill out step two of the forum. Make sure to submit all your MRI images plus report. You can submit the MRI through the mail, file upload, or medical record release. You can drag and drop or upload images into the forum. Things to remember when submitting your free MRI review. All MRI images must be submitted along with the report in order for it to be reviewed. Once your case is reviewed by our team, a patient advocate will contact you. Thanks for choosing Duke Spine Institute. How to request a free MRI review. Who are we and what we do? With world-class physicians on staff, the newest and most advanced technology, Duke Spine Institute has performed thousands of procedures and achieves a 95% success rate in elimination of pain. Treatments? Every patient comes to us with a unique set of challenges. That's why we address every patient's care individually. These are some of the world-class treatment options available at Duke Spine Institute. Duke Laser Disc Repair, Duke Spinal Fusion, Rhizotomy, epidural injection, kyphoplasty, physical therapy. Meet Dr. Duke, world-renowned board-certified neurosurgeon. Go to www.mri.dukespine.com. Click the free MRI review tab on the upper right. Complete the patient information form. Continue to fill out step two of the forum. Make sure to submit all your MRI images plus report. You can submit the MRI through the mail, file upload, or medical record release. You can drag and drop or upload images into the forum. Things to remember when submitting your free MRI review. All MRI images must be submitted along with the report in order for it to be reviewed. Once your case is reviewed by our team, a patient advocate will contact you. Thanks for choosing Duke Spine Institute.
Hello and happy holidays. We have free turkeys to get, oh, wait, never mind, sorry. We're just wrapping up spine surgery here at Duke Spine Institute. We have free spines to give out. We just finished operating on a patient's neck or cervical spine. As a matter of fact, the spine is in the center of the neck and we didn't really operate on the neck things because that's ear, nose, and throat. We operated on the spine. This patient had three herniated discs and I went in through the front, went past the disc to the back part where the herniation is. So looking at this model, just to give you an idea, this is the front of the spine and that's the back of the spine. The front of the spine has what's called vertebral bodies and a, the front of the disc, but the back of the disc is still part of the front of the spine. I know it's confusing. I didn't make this stuff up, but at the back of the disc, there are herniations like this one here, hitting nerves, going out the holes and crushing those nerves. Now the back of the spine is way back here. We're not that interested in that part of the spine. So what I did with the Duke laser disc repair is I came through the front of the disc because the disc is soft. I could pass through it quite easily. And I went to the back here where the herniation is and I basically used the laser to zap out the herniation and clean up the back of the disc where there's a big tear where the herniation came through and started pushing on the nerves. Of course, I took the pressure off the nerves while we're back there. I was able to fix three discs by basically going in, coming out, and then sliding along the front of the spine, and then going into the next disc. And then coming out, sliding along the front of the spine, like a little slippy slide, and then going into the top disc. So I did one, two, three discs middle, bottom, top, in that order. And everything went really good. Didn't have any complications or problems. We lost one drop of blood, just one. Compare that to a bloody cervical fusion. I'm gonna go ahead and show you a comparison video right now. So you can see the difference between what other surgeons are doing versus what we're doing right here at Duke Spine Institute to treat cervical disc herniations causing neck pain or arm symptoms. Type your questions up while you're watching this video so I can have lots of questions to answer for you. Duke Laser Disc Repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A symptomatic Duke Laser Disc Repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. 
The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home enjoying life with a very fast recovery allowing normal activities without pain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke Laser Disc Repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke laser disc repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, Patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke laser disc repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke laser disc repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke laser disc repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke laser disc repair is in a matter of hours or days rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke laser disc repair, normal movements of the joints in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke laser disc repair. In fact, most Duke laser disc repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke laser disc repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke Laser Disc Repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. I'm sorry about the technical issues we're having, but hopefully you caught the... Uh the gist of the video, which is really a comparison of 
an open spine surgery like spinal fusion on the neck with a metal plate. Uh, obviously with three levels, it's, this is a one level plate, so you can imagine a three level plate's much bigger. Um, we're avoiding all that. We didn't sneak a plate in when you weren't looking. Uh, this is a four millimeter incision. And there is no metal, there's no plates, there's no fusion, there's no bone graft. Literally all natural repair of the disc, which is better for patients. And that's why we do it. We have a question, Diego, from one of our audience. Yes, doctor. Is the section weight for this surgery with the laser less than a fusion? So someone's asking about the infection rate with the laser versus a fusion. Absolutely. We've had zero infections to date. Uh, on the other hand, with fusion surgery, the infection rate can be anywhere between 1% up to 15%. Depends on the type of fusion being done and many other factors, how many levels, how much bleeding, the patient's body temperature. There are a lot of variables, but infections are extremely rare with the Duke laser disc repair. We've done 1,400 surgeries now, and like I said, we've had zero infections to date. Just to show you, this is a one-level fusion. This is a two-level fusion. Imagine what a three-level fusion is like. Um, it's a lot of metal, a lot of screws a lot of loss of mobility of your neck. Who wants a stiff neck that can't turn, that can't bend, can't extend, all right? So to preserve your natural movement, have a natural surgery like the Duke laser disc repair, so we're not doing any fusion of bones, losing movement. Mm -hmm. And the last one, we have a question that just came in. Do you train surgeons or do you heavy train surgeons? Do I train surgeons to do this type of surgery? Yes, I do train surgeons. However, the truth is, is that very few show up knocking on the door. Why? All right, let me tell you why. See this surgery? This pays the surgeon about $7,000, okay? Uh, for laser surgery, I make about $2,000. So, seven versus two, or nothing. If the, pay, if, the, if the insurance doesn't pay, sometimes I get nothing. Point is, Doctors make a lot more money doing fusions. Lumbar fusion, these screws and rods and cages, they cost about $10,000 right here in implants. So there are companies that manufacture these implants like Johnson & Johnson and Medtronic Sophomore Danix and Alphatech, just to name a few. These companies manufacture these screws for literally less than a hundred dollars for all this stuff and they turn around and sell it for ten thousand dollars so the profit margins are massive they do a lot of marketing they literally go to the universities where surgeons are being trained and they infiltrate the entire department of neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery they basically sponsor all the national meetings they spend millions and millions of dollars supporting neurosurgical organizations and they have their top spine surgeons that are on their payroll that run our organizations. So they have basically infiltrated is the best word, taking control of the neurosurgical and orthopedic spine surgery agenda in the United States. And they control 6,000 surgeons that do complex spinal reconstruction. And basically, they are steering these surgeons away from less invasive surgeries like endoscopic. Endoscopic spine surgeons make less money. We don't have metal and implants to put in. So there is no big company that is marketing these techniques, supporting these techniques, and promoting these techniques among the surgeons, among the uh, governing bodies of the surgeons, and among the patients. There's no marketing. So because of that, people don't know about it. Surgeons don't know about it, and patients don't know about it. Hospitals don't know about it, universities don't know about it, nobody knows about it. It's been kept in the dark by the implant companies. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can watch some of our Spine Scams Exposed series. And in Spine Scams Exposed, we talk about how the big companies are basically controlling your care. And they're making sure that you, the patient, or I should say, you, the guinea pig, 
get plenty of metal put in your body whenever you have a spine problem, when instead you really don't need that metal, you just need an endoscopic tube laser disc repair. I guess that was our last question, so we'll be back in about 30, 40 minutes with our last surgery of the day. It's a patient with two herniated discs in her lower back and horrible back pain. We're going to go in there and fix that for her endoscopic.